Order, order. This is the second formal evidence session of the Environmental Audit Committee inquiry into the role of natural capital in the green economy. Um, today we're going to hear from investment organisation, innovators and the Green Finance Institute. Um, welcome the first panel. I'd like to, you to take it in turns briefly to introduce yourself. I'm going to go from my side of it, from left to right, starting with Helen Avery. Hi, uh, thank you very much for inviting me. My name is Helen Avery. I'm director of the Green um, of the Nature Programmes at the Green Finance Institute. Um, we work across two uh, approaches to how we mobilise private sector capital into nature. The first is around sort of the short-term nature markets. So we work on supply, demand, and enabling policy in the UK. And then we also work on the broader transition to an economy that values uh, and invests in nature. We host the TNFD uh, Secretariat and also the UK National Consultation Group. Wonderful. Thank you. Andy. Thanks. I'm Andy Howard. I'm the Global Head of Sustainable Investment at Schroders. We are a global asset manager, um, managing portfolios for our clients in a whole range of different asset classes in different parts of the world, both public and private. Nature is an important part of how we think about sustainability as a firm, both in terms of how we can invest directly into natural capital, nature-based solutions, uh, but also how we think about managing risk and identifying opportunities across the public market, equity, credit portfolios that we manage uh, across the firm. And finally, Gordon. Hi there, good afternoon. My name is Gordon Bennett. I work for ICE. Uh, we're the largest energy and environmental marketplace in the world and the owner of the New York Stock Exchange. Interesting. I'm going to kick off um, trying to explore how the UK can use its role in the world's financial markets to develop an effective and uh, influential model for nature finance. This starter question is going to be for all of you, but I'm going to, for no particular reason, start with you, Gordon. Um, where we are at the moment, is the UK currently well placed to affect a leading role in the global market for <coughs> natural capital trade? I think. Uh, yes, I believe so, uh, for, for a number of reasons. I think that uh, from a net zero perspective, natural capital is, is clearly an important part of solving for net, net zero, particularly around carbon sinks. Uh, the UK has a good policy record in supporting markets uh, for net zero with things like the low carbon contracts company and also... Uh, the unilateral, uh, including the carbon price support mechanism when carbon prices were, were too low post-financial crisis, that uh, unilateral intervention really helped the UK get coal out of the merit order in electricity. And, and I think importantly, the UK has shown to be a, a fantastic steward of financial markets. Uh, and so the, the sort of the, the bedrock there is there, the, the, the sort of the historical policy support is there. And if you're thinking about net zero from a market's point of view and from an economics point of view, you need to know two things, the price of energy and the price of carbon. And at ICE, uh, all of our energy and, and carbon markets are risk managed within the UK. So we're, we're definitely at the center of uh, financial markets. If I understand your answer correctly, we have the building blocks in place, we have the credibility, but do we yet have the scale? What, what is the scale of the market in the UK? For nature? Hmm. Well, I think the scale for nature in market internationally is, is, is small. We, I, I wouldn't describe it as a market. When I, market means lots of things to different people, but if I'm thinking about it in terms of financial market, it, it really doesn't exist at any scale today. Does it exist anywhere in the world? No, n not really, no. In question to you, Andy. The, um, the ability of the UK to play a leading role in this sector? Um, I, I, without trying to repeat too many of the same points, I think it's the, the point that I would make in, in starting is that this is a market which will need to grow very significantly. To echo some of those points, by our calculations, if you look at the value of natural capital assets, if that was a discrete asset class of its own, it would be about 0.2% of the value of the assets managed by the asset management industry globally at most. It's, it's very small and will need to become significantly bigger. So. In terms of where we stand, I think I, I would say the UK is well placed for all of the reasons that Gordon mentions. We've got expertise, we've got a supportive policy environment, we've got a well respected internationally policy framework as well and policy um, uh, voice uh, to lend. Um, but it is an industry that the growth lies ahead of us more than it lies behind us. And I think it's therefore building blocks that need to be built on. Helen, have you got anything further to add on that, on that initial question? Um, 
Yes, I think actually just some what we could do, is, um, for example. So obviously we're in a good position, but it's early days. We've got quite a long arc until we get to the point where it's sort of green finance and pension funds can invest. That's a long arc. But along that journey, we can lead by um, uh, encouraging firms to disclose on nature-related impacts and dependencies through TNFD. We can adopt taxonomy. Uh, we, we're actually developing a step further than the EU taxonomy by looking at nature at the moment under LNAS, uh, a, a program under the taxonomy. Um, posit nature positive pathways is something we can lead on, and I think that's in the works with WWF, and that's something the UK will lead on. So that whole arc to actually get us to a system and actually can invest would be incredible. On the nature market side, we, we are you know, up there with the US and Australia on some of these nature markets. We've got biodiversity net gain. That's really groundbreaking. So that needs to be successful. And we've got very high integrity voluntary carbon markets as well. But there are some challenges with them that is stopping the supply. Mainly, we've got a huge uh, appetite from investors, but we haven't got corporate demand and the push on corporates. Uh, Andy, just developing on that, as an investor, the representative of the investor body, uh, which is why you're on this panel, uh, we've we've seen that the the bedding is in place. We've got we've got the right reputation. We're in the right place. What historically has prevented you from investing further in this sector? You you re reference it's 0.2 percent of all investments, so it's de minimis at the moment. So just give us a flavour of what's held you back, and then if you could develop that into quick wins that you think the the policy makers could take to accelerate the development of the market. Um, and I will frame this in the context of as an asset manager, the, man the portfolios we manage are for our clients rather than de decisions that we're making laterally. But, but, but looking in that context, I think there is a scale challenge in terms of how do we scale the size of many of the projects that we're describing and how do we scale the size of the, the market as a whole. Liquidity, scale are important in terms of there's a chicken and egg situation there, I realise, in terms of how do you get to that point. The trade um, I think the framing, or sorry, the, the, the standards that we need ultimately in terms of how we... I don't want to step back too far, but stepping back for a moment, fundamentally we need to put a value on nature which ensures that the value of assets or projects that restore or protect nature are valued commensurate or more commensurately with the social planetary value that they create. There's a gap between those two things that ultimately is going to be critical to establishing a clear financial and investment incentive for more investment into this field. There is demand, there is interest, certainly from many of our clients and indeed from you know, across Schroders, but ultimately identifying ways to make the economics of those projects more compelling than they are in many cases is going to be really critical to, um, to bringing in more capital um, going forward. Just going to allow an intervention from Chris Grady. Quick question. Declaration, I am an unpaid UK-based trustee of the African Wildlife Foundation. Um, one of the things that we have discussed, and I'd be interested to get your view on, is the, and you mentioned the issue of scale. Um, can you envisage a situation where actually uh, the only real way to secure investment is to package projects together into more of a single sort of unit portfolio into which people can buy? Um, because in particular within the UK, any available projects really are very small relative for a big international investment institution. Does one need to package these together into a broader basket of products? That probably will be part, I can envisage that being part of the solution. Um, I think ultimately you still have the challenge in, in that context of how do you ensure that there is oversight of the underlying project that is appropriate. That you know, One of the challenges here is this isn't just a purely, this, we're not ultimately talking about financial instruments. It's not like packaging together bonds or other financial securities in, in, in the same way. Well, it's certainly not like that in the sense of pieces of paper. So there is ultimately a question of ensuring that the assets that we're talking about are being properly yeah. overseen and monitored. And, and scale can help with that. Um, putting things together can help with that to some degree, but it doesn't entirely solve all of those problems. Yeah, and Gordon, I mean, you, you, you create the market or you oversee the market. Can you expand on this idea of, of being able to invest at some scale? Is that an opportunity for you? Is that something you can help with? Well, it's certainly an, an area that we're in, investing in a lot of time and, 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 and capital. The, 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 the challenge is that, from where I sit, there's, there's not a lot of demand, and you can't have a market without demand. And if you, if you think about the markets that do work today from a carbon market perspective, it's those that are mandated. So, so the polluter is mandated to to pay and really outside of government mandates there aren't really any markets at scale for externalities 
What impact has the government's policy decision on biodiversity net gain for significant developments had on the creation of that demand? Do you anticipate that developing in the, in the near term? Yeah, I, I don't really have enough proximity to, to biodiversity net gain in terms of creating a, a, a financial market. Um, so it's, that seems far away. If you were trying to, if you were trying to create some sort of demand with a government mandate, one idea would be to take a percentage of the UK ETS and allow polluters to, 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 to meet part of their obligation with buying a positive externality being sort of carbon sink of, of, of nature that would that would crystallize some sort of demand. The other thing it would do if, if the government could people are looking for sort of safety stroke air cover in terms of buying carbon carbon credits so if the government can endorse a particular standard and give buyers safety I think that potentially stimulate some voluntary buying as well. So having a common version of the truth is it would be very helpful in, in developing the market. Y yeah, there's some some government support on saying what is is acceptable. I mean ultimately quality is subjective and, and, and that the market solves for that. You can solve for that through through price. But there is that there feels like anecdotally people are waiting on the sidelines because there's a lot of negative publicity around around carbon credits in general. I, I'm only talking about that's just carbon. Clearly nature does far more than just sequester and store carbon. And, and the challenge of course is that whereas uh, CO2 measurement is a definite thing, biodiversity net gain is much more and more therefore harder to quantify and, and unitize. Right, Barry Gardner. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, I, I want to sort of focus on what may be the perceived inadequacies of the current economic m model and, and how we can capture the value of natural capital and, and move more into uh, a wealth accounting uh, framework, natural wealth accounting. So, and first of all, Mr. Bennett, just to, to say congratulations on being the Sustainable Business Leader of the Year in 2022. Yes. Uh, who is it in 2023 and four? Oh, no, it wasn't me, though. So. <laughs> um, Thank you. Uh, maybe we should speak to him next time, Jim. Yeah. Uh, or her, absolutely. Uh, um, can I ask you about um, Easy mistake. GDP as an appropriate... Uh, lens from which to view natural capital, or rather, what are the inadequacies of looking at economic activity rather than looking at wealth in trying to capture this shift from uh, the current to a nature positive outlook? Black people. Yeah, I, I won't. I won't talk specifically to GDP, but effectively the. The challenge is that we don't use externalities in our current economic model enough. And so I'd, I'd like to use a quote from uh, Michael Greenstone, who's the Milton Friedman Distinguished Professor of Economics from the University of Chicago. He says, currently the atmosphere is free. It doesn't take an advanced degree in economics to figure out the things that people get for free. They use an awful lot of. So I mean, externalities is an economic theory. We operate markets that price externalities. So they're kind of there. They're just, they're just not being used. So as I go back to my earlier point around um, outside of government mandates, externalities are not really used at, at scale. So people haven't, people are not... We you say they're not used. I mean, the, the, the problem surely is that they are being utilised, they're being abused, and they're not being counted within the economic model. So it's not that they're not being used, it's that we leave them out of our cost-benefit analysis when we're conducting our, our examination of things, isn't it? I mean, we're, we're relying the, on them precisely as the free and gratis uh, benefit that nature provides. It's a public good, and you're right, it gets, it gets used extensively, but it doesn't get factored into our economy. Yes, it when it degrades, yes. uh -huh. we're not actually taking that degradation into account. Yes, yeah, so na na nature produces all of these positive externalities that it doesn't get rewarded for today. But the, what, the, if you 
if you basically recognize your negative externality pollution as a financial liability, then you go and offset that financial liability by buying uh, a nature asset. So, so it, you solve for both. You solve for both things. You solve for the source, the root cause of climate risk is not paying to use the atmosphere. We built society on the assumption that the atmosphere is infinite. It's not. Uh, it's finite at set temperature targets, and you can use economics to solve for the allocation of scarce resources. So, recognize the financial. I think this is your point around accounting. Recognize the financial liability of the negative, the pollution. Incentivize the purchase of positives like nature or other carbon reductions and removals. And, and the difficulty, of course, as the, as, as the chair alluded to, is getting a unitary framework to do that or a metric with which to do that. Um, but the ONS has, has done some pretty groundbreaking work recently on that. And, and I take it you're aware of what they've been doing in, in that sphere. So can you explain to us how that might help um, to create the sort of markets that we do need to see, because I agree with you, these markets don't exist in any extent uh, at the moment, and it's only by government regulation that they exist at all, in effect. Yeah, I'm, sorry, I'm not aware of, of, of the work of the, the ONS, but right. I don't know. Ms. Avery, are you, you're aware of this? Are you referring to the GII and the NII, the net inclusive income and the gross? I, I'm income? talking about the, it was their, uh, their 22, I think it was March 22, update on, on um, new beyond GDP yeah. measures. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I think it's, a, I mean, it's vital. So, for example, at the moment, agriculture is less than 1% of GDP. It's 71% of our land. Uh, and so if we keep looking to GDP, we're not going to end up actually protecting some of the things that we absolutely need to do for resilience. Um, so... And how <laughs> half of the world's GDP um, is dependent upon nature. 58 trillion was the calculation. It's highly dependent. Yeah. Actually, highly, nine, or highly yeah. dependent and dependent, I think. Yeah, yeah. I think 99 percent is dependent on natural capital. Um, and actually, we are publishing a report in April that shows UK GDP impact from nature-related risk with Bank of England data. So that's something just to put on your radar. I can talk about that more. Um, it is really important. I would say that we have a really strong natural capital account. It's really highly regarded, and that helps guide our policy, as you know. Um, with the net inclusive income um, and the GII, that goes some ways. A lot of countries will supplement their GDP by having another um, indicator, like Bhutan, for example, has its gross um, happiness, and Scotland has its um, national performance net framework, I believe it's called, and um, that includes the environment and society. Does that naturally lead to markets? I think it leads to policy changes that can ultimately lead to compliance markets that can then create the demand that can create markets. You've talked about economic risk um, earlier, and yes, there's, there's the economic risk from pollution, whether it's the economic risk that is going to be borne by our health service, whether it's days off work um, because of pollution, all of these downsides which are, are not accounted for very often in, in the way in which we, um, we look at this. How can business models be designed to account for the value of that natural capital and understand that that loss to nature, to our, our, our natural wealth, is actually an economic risk that crystallizes out. It just crystallizes out elsewhere. It crystallizes out in, in the health service. It crystallizes out in, in, in you know, cleanup of, of, of pollution, it, relying on, on public services to do the dirty work. So how, how do we integrate what is in, in essentially the private capture of those externalities with the public good so that they can work together to enhance and, and become a nature positive model? Anyone. I, I, I'm, solutions from anywhere would be really helpful. Sure. So, um, <laughs> the Task Force on Nature Related Financial Disclosures, which the UK government put millions into, actually, is obviously launched. And that's a disclosure framework that asks companies to report on their impacts and dependencies. Once they start to report on what their impacts are and their dependencies, they can start to understand what's the material risk. Until that is mandated, and I speak with a markets hat on, not my TNFD affiliation hat on, yes. um, that's going to be hard to do. And the 
that the economic risk and the financial stability is not being captured because we can't get under the supply chain of where those assets are located and their risk so at if, present. If, if this committee were to be putting forward a report to government, which of course it is, and were it to make some recommendations in that report, one of them, as far as you're concerned, ought to be that we ask that the TCFND should be mandatory. Yes. Can I just come very quickly on that? Yeah. I, well, I, I wanted to hear what Mr. Howard and Mr. Bennett had to say, but please, Chris, come. Just to say, absolutely get that, but does investor pressure mean they're going to do it anyway? They haven't yet. <laughs> Segway. Um, so I think, I mean, I'm going to pick up a little bit on the points previously around yeah, sure. the economics and how do we think about that connection, because I think um, Gordon's point about how do we connect an economic view of the world, and that is incredibly important from a policy perspective to understand where are there disconnects between the policy framework that we have in place and where there are societal or planetary costs that aren't being, or, or benefits, that aren't being accounted for in our current model, our current framing of you know, what we're the objective, if, if you like, of, of, of a lot of policy. And I think ultimately the question comes, what, what are the mechanisms that can close that gap? But transparency is critical. So without information, it becomes very difficult to do anything very much. But it's probably not sufficient in isolation to drive change on the scale that we ultimately need to see it driven. But conventionally, if you think about other areas where similar challenges exist, whether that be around tobacco or alcoholism or other, other areas, you typically end up with one of, one of possibly three approaches or a combination thereof. One of them being in this case, a, a standard cost imposition, which may be duties on cigarettes or, to, or, or alcohol, one of which may be consumer pr pressure through, for example, um, consumers, as they become more aware, as they have more information, making different decisions about what sorts of products they want to buy. Um, and we see that in some areas as well. Um, or finally, in terms of markets that can, and here an example would be, I think, something like carbon markets, where emitting carbon into the atmosphere is a an externality that historically was free is no longer free in many industries um, and putting a price on that which is in economic principles a more efficient way of doing it you, you allow the it, it creates a sort of better economic efficiency it's also a slower process um, in, in many ways than, than than the first two things but I think ultimately it's figuring out what's that relationship because an economic view established that doesn't ultimately lead to a change which causes that economic view to become a financial view is less helpful. It's, it's establishing that bridge from an economic disconnect to a financial or an investment. Impact. Indeed. But we can keep on talking about um, an old model which says, yes, there is a price that the public pays because of pollution, let's just call it pollution um, for now, um, and that price then has to be paid offset in some way. Or you can move to a model that says, it, in, in our preparation, in, in our, uh, our evaluation of any project right at the start, all of these things have to be brought together. Now, you can't do it without a metric, you can't do it without the transparency, but it's changing the model from one of pollute and then pay, and the trouble at the moment is you pollute and you don't pay, um, but changing that model to one that says, if you have the sort of model of natural wealth accounting that I think the ONS is trying to work its way towards, then you actually start from a different place, don't you? I, I think you do, but I think equally it's the, how, it's the pay bit, as you say, that historically has been the challenge. If you can establish a picture that there were a, a belief that, that that pay will be there, there will be a... A, a penalty, and I don't just mean a penalty necessarily in the form of a cheque, but a penalty in, the, in broad terms for polluting activities, and using the same broad term, then you make the decision earlier on of how do I design this or how do I operate in a way which creates less pollution in the first place, Indeed. because I, it's in everyone's own self-interest. So that you move from a policing situation to one where the incentives are aligned yes. from the beginning of the process, which all of the things that you're describing, I think, are an important part of how you get to that point. But it is ultimately about creating those incentives to become aligned. And at the moment, if you've only got an insufficient side on one half, it, it, it doesn't quite work. Indeed. And, and the, Barry, final question. The, the private sector model, which in effect captures the, the natural assets, the natural capital, which were previously regarded as externalities, has to then be aligned with the public good model. And, and at the moment, 
there is not a mechanism for doing that. And what I'm asking you is how do we get there? And again, any takers, please. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I, I'll go back to some of my original comments around, uh, so I, I, I think I agree with what you're saying. We, we effectively cash account for, I know this is about nature, but uh, talking about climate, we basically a cash account for climate risk. So the cost, we incur the cost at some point down the line and we, we pay for it, whether it's, you know, cleaning something up or, or extra costs and, and, and healthcare. So we're not, we're not pricing it. You know, if you're thinking about, I'm an accountant by training, if you're thinking about a set of accounts, if you cash account a set of accounts, how are investors, before cash accounting, how did investors take a look at a company and invest? But that's what we're doing with climate risk. It's sort of this existential threat. So I struggle to reconcile how we can look at this existential, th existential threat and cash account for it. You should at least be accrual accounting, and ideally you would be marking, marking to market. So it, it, it's about pricing risk. When it, when, it, when it comes down to sustainability, we, we have this concept of double materiality, which is like financial risk and something else, which we can't put a number on. But the thing is, with, with negative externality of pollution, you can, you can actually put a number on it and take it out of this other double materiality. When we built approach. bridges, right, we didn't know what journeys and what we were going to save and what the social benefit was going to be. But we factored a straw figure into the accounting to determine whether actually the capital project of building the bridge and the journeys it would shorten and the trade that it would increase, we couldn't judge it. We didn't have the transparency, just as we don't have for, for the, the natural assets. We didn't have that transparency. We didn't have that metric, but we did it. And then we refined it over a period of time. Is that not what we should be doing here? Very brief answers, please. OK. Um, well, we can't price the risk unless we're measuring it. And at the moment, unless we have TNFD, we're not going to be able to know what actually is the risk on people's books of companies. And to the Honourable Member's question on all well, the financial sector, I'm, I'm not with the financial sector, but we work with them on TNFD, um, is that if we look at TCFD, actually disclosures aren't all that. Uh, and that's ha they've had pressure from financial institutions, unless it's mandated, and the UK has obviously mandated TCFD, the chances are, actually, no, it's not going to be enough pressure. Thank you very much. I know it's a very interesting topic, but we do have to move on. Clive Lewis. Thank you, Chair. I want to talk about motivation, um, what motivates natural capital investment. So starting with you, Andy, what do you think motivates natural capital investments? You can list them in terms of the kind of priority, um, if, if that helps, but what are the main motivations for natural capital investments? I think, I mean, it's so the asset, there are different types of investors in natural capital investments. You have what we might call mission, and I'm going to put the public sector or the multilateral development banks to, to slightly to one side from this question, although they are an important part of the picture. You have more mission-driven mission investors who are, or purpose-led investors who will look at this from the perspective of how do we deploy capital into areas that will deliver an environmental benefit. Um, and typically they're looking at this from the perspective of I've got a certain amount of capital to deploy, what's the best bang I can get for my buck? if you like. It's not necessarily in terms of purely how do I put a value on this, but if I've got a certain amount of money to spend, how do I achieve the most impact from that? And there will typically be a return expectation in the investment return sense of the word, um, but it may be, may be lower um, than people would look for elsewhere. The bigger pools of capital, I think, is those investors who are seeking to, to invest in a sustainable and a responsible way, who recognise that nature loss is an important societal challenge are looking at this either through the perspective of a responsibility as large asset owners to play a role in that, or who are looking at it through the perspective that the discussions like the one we're having here today will ultimately lead nature to become an increasingly important financial risk or financial opportunity for, for the value of assets. That second pool is a sizable pool of people who are interested but who ultimately need to see that there is an economic return. They have a responsibility to their beneficiaries to ultimately deliver an economic return um, from, from the investments that they're making. And so I think the motivations are, first of all, in some case, in many cases, a desire to play a positive contribution. In a, a, a large number of cases, it's a conviction that sustain, managing assets sustainably, managing assets in a way that's commensurate with the, the, 
both the world that we would like to move to, but also, equally importantly, the way the policy environment, the way social pressures are likely to change the value of the assets that people have invested in uh, is an important part. Um, and ultimately, to be clear, one theme that runs through all of those things is, is, a, is a desire to generate a return. Um, you know, that is kind of the one thing that unites most investors, is a belief that there's a return from, gener from, from investing in those assets. Um, just that, you know, I'm, I mean, obviously not an investor, but what we see is obviously they're looking for standards and confidence that what they're going to invest in isn't going to be in the Guardian the following week as, as being bad. Um, uh, and obviously deal size, and that's one of the challenges we've had in the UK market. We've talked about some of the aggregation models that we need to actually bring them up to a size that can work for investors. And it's the, obviously the return size. So, so at the moment, you know, we've had a couple of deals just in the UK, 6% um, returns. Triodos made some loans uh, to the Y, Natural Flood Management, and also to Trees for Life. That was a, that was a bond that was also 6%. UK Infrastructure Bank has made a bridge loan to Highlands Rewilding that was came in about 13%, but they are too high for actually these projects. These projects need more like 2 to 3%. So that's sort of one of the challenges at the moment is that we have just a disconnect between what investors need uh, for their fiduciary duty and then actually what these projects can provide. And again, the missing link in that is the demand driver. The more demand that we have for buying these credits, the higher, higher the price will go. So does the fiduciary duty need to change, potentially? That's one for you, I know. <laughs> um, so, I don't think it does, um, particularly. I think that ultimately, you can look at this one of two ways. You can look at this through the lens of changing the duty that in, institutional investors have towards their beneficiaries, or you can look at it through what are the other levers that we can pull to make the investments fundamentally more attractive. There isn't a resistance, for the most part, that I'm aware of, for people not wanting, having a sort of fundamental or a philosophical lack of resistance to investment, it is a belief that ultimately establish or generating a return from the investments that they're making is important. And I think, I mean, it has changed a bit over the last 18 months or so. In a lower interest rate environment, generating 6, 8, 10% returns was reasonably attractive for the risk profile that you were taking on. That's changed a bit as interest rates have moved. Um, as you say, demand for carbon credits hasn't followed the path that we were anticipating maybe 12, 18 months ago. And so these things, that's a, that's a relatively short time frame in the scheme of things, but there are, that it does indicate that this, that the, the attractiveness of those projects is sensitive to changes that can happen and play out over a relatively short period of time. And I do think that how do we create ways to make those projects fundamentally more attractive is more, more useful than thinking, how do we change, or, I know this isn't quite what you're saying, but how do we change the, the, the objective of those investors to, to, to push them to invest? There are some economists now who would say that what we're beginning to see in terms of food prices, in terms of um, commodity markets and so on, is you're beginning to see a systemic, uh, systemic nature of climate collapse. So in terms of coffee prices, food prices, I know, for example, you, it's impossible to buy futures for cocoa at the moment, or very difficult to buy futures for cocoa at the moment because um, the global market for cocoa is struggling from, in part, mainly climatic issues. That's what the climate crisis looks like. And, and that, so these are, in, in turn, driving the, the foundations of economic shocks. And that has an impact on inflation. That has an impact then on central banks and interest rates, which then makes things less attractive and more difficult. So you can see the cycle that we're now trapped in. So I think people listening at home will be listening to this and thinking, well, we're in the third century of the 21st century. We've known this has been happening for now almost 50 years now, maybe more. Um, we seem to be trapped in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a death cycle, a death spin. You know, we know it's getting worse, and yet still at the same time, the market isn't attractive enough for investors to do what they need to do. Something isn't working, and it's getting worse. So how do we short-circuit that? Um, I can talk about the work with, that we're doing currently with Oxford and Reading Universities and UNIT WCMC and the National Institute for Economic and Social Research with the Bank of England data. Um, and that is, we've developed a, a national, it's the first of its kind, where I gather the US is shortly behind, a, a national um, nature-related risk inventory. So it looks like it looks at the um, likelihood uh, and the highest impact ecological um, challenges that we have and the likelihood of that impact on the economy. So in the top, this was released today, in the top right-hand corner, the biggest risks we have are soil health decline, uh, AMR, 
um, uh, zoonotic diseases. Also high up there is tipping points. Um, I could go on, but I won't because I'm keeping it short. But the point is, you've, you need, every country needs to know what are your nature-related risks. And then to my point on the disclosures, we need to understand are our companies exposed to these risks? And then we can back it out into what's the impact on GDP, if we even think GDP is the right measure, and, and then back it out into financial stability. So to your point, we absolutely have to know where we stand at the moment. We're not capturing it. Anyone else want to come in on that? I guess, I guess then the question is, this, is, is how do we, our, our simple, I know you've prior, you said that most companies still need to have their, their primary concern or those organisations investing, companies and organisations investing in this need to have a financial return. I mean, given the threat to businesses posed by the degradation of nature, given the kind of existential threat of, cl of climate and ecological collapse, is a return enough? Is that, is that, I mean, I understand it's not the only metric, you've said that, but it's, it's still the priority. I mean, is, is, is that really acceptable at this stage of where we can see the science heading? I think it's unsust I mean, it goes back to the broader question about how we think about economic growth and the fact that economic growth for decades has been built increasingly on depleting resources, however you define resources, that are becoming more and more depleted as a result and therefore that's putting more and more pressure on the nature of, of growth. I do think the solution to the problem, if you think about this in terms of you've got an, an externality, a, it's a tragedy of the commons problem effectively and, and in that scenario a broad based intervention that establishes first of all transparency about what those costs are and then the mechanisms to ensure that those costs are recognised in the way that capital is deployed, the way that business decisions are made, the way that companies succeed or fail, it's going to be important. This isn't unique to nature. Um, there's, you know, there's, there's lots of areas where similar sorts of challenges exist. It's just an area that's become increasingly acute and, and clear, I think, over the last, the last few years in particular. Yeah. Well, to think that the point earlier on around you sort of kind of need to get on with it and try something, right? Because the cost of doing nothing is far higher. So, again, I have lots of proximity to carbon and cap and trade. It's not like cap and trade was was a success from from the off. It's continually been recalibrated. So it's it, you're not going to get the right answer, uh, and you're going to have to continually recalibrate. But you've got to start somewhere. And so this whole sort of discussion around quality. I mean, quality is subjective at the end of the day. And so let willing buyers and sellers figure out what they want to buy and sell from each other. And, 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 and quality can change over time. What people want to buy changes over time. There's, there's nothing wrong with that. But yeah. the key is to start. OK, thank you very much. Caroline Lucas. Thank you very much. I wanted to go back to the issue of transparency, which um, all of you have said in different ways, I think, is, is important. And I wanted to start with um, Helen and ask whether you think that um, transactions of natural capital investment, uh, should they be publicly registered, do you think, so that they're there for everyone to see? Um, yes. So um, we have quite good transparency in our carbon markets at the moment. So um, Woodland Carbon Code and Peatland Carbon Code, um, they register on the UK Land Carbon Registry, and there's a UK Carbon Price Index, which can give like an aggregate of the price. So, um, and there's quite a lot of data out around where the projects are uh, and, and to a lesser extent, who is buying them. That's actually one of the challenges at the moment. We don't know who's buying them. Um, um, there is uh, a World Carbon Standard, I don't know if you're familiar with them, but they have gone a step further, created their own registry where they actually disclose who the buyers are. B&G, I mean, it's very new, biodiversity net gain. There is an issue with lack of transparency. We don't have a register for on-site gains um, at the moment, um, uh, which is going to be a, a challenge because it creates an uneven playing field. Um, and also it's not clear how the transactions are like just you know some farmers being offered 900 where it's more like 20,000 to 40,000 for a unit so we do really need to start saying what is the average price the biggest challenges are that um, you know I think it's people don't want to disclose the price they're paying and that's fine we can have an aggregate price disclosure on registries um, but buyers are pushing back about wanting to own uh, remain anonymous and I think there's a case to be made that actually you know we want this market to develop let's if we're saying who the sellers are let's say who the buyers are so yeah I check with uh, with with Andy and then Gordon uh, Andy first w do you agree with what Helen just said broadly I think the importance of having price transparency in a market that you want to develop is really critical um, in order knowing who the buyers are too um, yes I think that's you should I think the, the practicalities just give, given the way things work is, is can often be trickier, but I think the more transparency you can create to establish confidence in a market is going to be really important. I think it's also important that we recognise, in much the same way we find in voluntary carbon markets, there are different, it's not as though a tonne of carbon 
has the same price in every situation in which that carbon is sequestered. Um, different types of credits have got different types of price. We understand that. We can establish, and we have now established a number of indices to track different types of prices based on different types of characteristics. Price transparency is important in terms of establishing, therefore, what, what a fair price is. That's what creates confidence in the market. That's what creates, therefore, the willingness to invest behind it. So, so, so yes. And anything to, to, to add, Gordon, and also the issue of, of not only who's paying for what, but what the outcomes for nature are to the extent that we know that too. Well, I, I think, so I, I generally agree. I, I think actually, certainly from a, again, from a, a carbon perspective, it's about, it's, it's one of the most transparent markets there, there is in terms of who owns the, a low bar, the, the credit. No, well... If you, I mean, you can basically see 75% of the credits, you know who owns them and, and who's retired them. And there, I'd say that's quite a, a high number compared to, to other markets. That's what I, I mean. I mean, that the, the yeah, bar yeah. is low because well, it's better I don't because know the rest is need, pretty I don't, I, I don't know opaque. if you, you need to know who the buyers and sellers are of, of, of everything. I think you do need price transparency as the key component in terms of... Uh, reducing the risk of, of ad adverse selection. So anyone can look at the UKA price on ICE today and the, the spread will be 20 pence. So, you know, it's like, it's effectively 37 pounds is, is, is the value. If you don't have price transparency, you know, what is value? And, and, and that, that would certainly, uh, I think, prohibit um, people participating, not knowing where, where, the, where the price is. And we've, we also think that, in, in carbon and, and nature markets that you know, we're trying to uh, create a, a primary market, a bit like uh, an, an IPO process for an equity or, or debt market where the primary transaction is conducted in the open and people can see it. And they can, the, 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 clearly the, the, the liquidity event is important in creating the price transparency, but the, the sort of the, the pre-IPO roadshow process allows buyer and seller to interact mm -hmm. and, and due diligence. So it brings far more transparency to what you're, what you're buying and, and the quality of it. Good. So all three of you are in favour of, of, of public um, registering uh, all of that, which is great. We'll put that in our report. Um, going back the other way around, so starting again with Gordon, do, do investments in natural capital expire? Um, is an asset leased for a certain discrete period, or is it owned permanently? How, how do you factor that into the market? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I, th th I suppose this goes to the question around permanence. Um, and it depends on what type of sort of investment you are making in in natural capital. Uh, again, going back to carbon, and there's like there's there's different types of methodologies. One is avoided deforestation, and one is afforestation. Um, but there, the permanence is rather subjective as as well. So nature sometimes get accused of, of not being permanent because of uh, fire risk and, and, and so mm. forth. But clearly uh, trees burn down, but the the uh, the the oldest uh, forest is over I think over a million years old. So that that's fairly that's fairly permanent. Uh, permanent is a permanence is a is a challenge. Helen, what do you think about that? Um, so obviously the Woodland Carbon Code, it's 30 to 100 years that we ask people to um, maintain that land for, um, and I do say peatland as well. Um, on NFM, natural flood management, it can be about 100 years, ten, definitely 10 years. On biodiversity net gain, it's 30 years. And this is kind of as close we can get. It's quite hard for farmers, especially to commit to those length of terms of contract. Um, and there is always a way to sort of, you know, then add on at the end. Um, the challenge, I think, is that... I think that's that's good that what we've got in you know, it's scientifically backed that we need um, we need that length of time, but the challenge is that the monitoring and evaluation over that period of time is costly and needs to be factored into the price. Not only that, if we are if you think of 30 years, how much the climate's going to change, some of these sites that offer BNG are going to uh, maybe not hit their targets, so we need all the insurance really as well, um, and also extra payments so that they're managing their climate risk as well as their nature-related risk. So I'm comfortable with, I mean, I'm not a scientist, but I'm comfortable that the scientists are comfortable in the UK with what we have for permanence. Close to permanence. I want to ask a different question to, to Andy, if I, I might, because when you were last before the committee in March of last year, I asked you about Schroeder's position as one of Drax's biggest shareholders and whether you could 
uh, whether you would be calling them out uh, to improve their disclosure on forest-related risk. And I wonder whether you've continued to push for higher levels of transparency from DRAX in particular, not least because you'll know that since we had that exchange uh, last year, Ofgem have opened an investigation into whether DRAX has breached its sustainability criteria, and recently the NEO as well has also said that it doesn't think there's enough information for government to be able to be um, confident that it's demonstrating that uh, the sustainability standards are met. So I wondered if you could say whether you have confidence, given that you're a... I'm saying, have you seen today's BBC exposure as well? So I have indeed. So today too. Yes. Um, so hopefully you got the follow-up response that we provided did, um, last, last time I was here. I'm happy to sort of follow up. I can, t I can confirm certainly that we continue to speak to DRAX very frequently, um, as well as a number of other parties and groups around DRAX to get that broader understanding of the topic. Um, and I can continue to say we, we take this extremely seriously in terms of how we look at those questions, those, those, th those topics. We remain shareholders in DRAX uh, at this point, but as you say, it's I know I'd be happy to follow up with you in more specifics. Obviously, there was, there's been news today that I won't try and comment on um, too quickly, but very happy to follow up with you in more detail if you'd like. If I could just have, have, have one thing on that. It, it's just, it, you did indeed follow up in writing, which, for which we're grateful. A and in that follow-up, um, you stated you recognise that deforestation and conversion pose significant uh, risks to the value of your investments. Um, you said that um, where you see no meaningful progress, you will escalate your concerns. And so I suppose the obvious question is whether or not the NEO findings, the ongoing mm -hmm. off-gem investigation into Drax's compliance and the threat of Enviva, uh, Drax's biggest wood pellet supplier on the verge of bankruptcy, does not all of that together automatically now mean that, you know, that feels like it should be a red light flashing on the dashboard? I, without trying to summarise what I can assure you are a lot of discussions both internally and with other groups uh, outside of Schroders on this particular topic. I can, I mean, let's frame it this way. The question is, has this been escalated? It is absolutely, has been escalated and remains escalated in terms of our attention within Wait, Schroders. When was it escalated? Sorry? When was it escalated? Oh, this has been a huge focus within the firm in terms of how we look at this. It's an important investment for you know, a number of investment teams or a number of portfolios that we manage within Schroders and we, we look at it and have done for some time. I suppose um, that slightly worries me in the sense that we've had a very similar conversation almost yeah. exactly a year ago now where you were also looking at it and it was an area of concern. We've now got the NEO, we've got Ofgem, you've got... The we, government itself, what is it going to take for you to do more than discuss it and escalate it? We, well, yeah, I mean, we, so I think you can assert from that that therefore our concerns, we continue to believe that the way that the company is taking itself forward, the, the role that the company plays and how it's conducting itself are things that we are comfortable um, with. But I say I, it would be more complete for me to follow up, as I, as I sort of say, there's a lot of people with very specific knowledge involved in a lot of different conversations and be happy to follow up on that. I would love you to do that in writing, that would be perfect, thank you. Thank you very much. Chris Grady. And just to say that the other side of the spectrum, I share the same concerns about Drax. Um, so did John Kerry two days ago at the, at the meeting that we had with him. So, no, that, that concern is growing. Mm -hmm. um, so can we talk on, move on to standards uh, before we finish off? Um, uh, first of all, uh, Helen, general point of principle, is it sensible for the UK and to, to seek to align itself with international standards on this in order to try and help develop the, uh, the investment opportunities? So just so I can understand the question, is that aligning sort of standards around, are we talking about um, uh, CSRD and uh, well, the, key, the, the, the key standards, to my mind, are they, uh, fundamentally, what, what's going to underpin... Um, any successfully developed market is do you have commonly accepted metrics um, you know, it, it's almost two stages you know, if, if you are going to do the equivalent of IPOing a nature project uh, for investors to invest in mm -hmm. you need uh, the, 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 the standards and metrics that judge basically firstly is this something that's bona fide enough to invest in and secondly over a period of time you need the metrics to track the progress to judge whether it's actually doing what it said on the tin. Yeah, so there are two things here. I think one is if we're looking at actually just like nature markets, um, 
uh, we obviously have the codes, so that's very helpful. We have standards and they align with international standards. So we are aligned there. Um, on some of the other standards, um, for, so for example, um, the CSRD, which is the reporting standards for the EU, um, they've expanded it to include nature uh, in addition to ESG, which I think is something we would want to align with. That said, 80% of um, UK publicly listed companies report in CSRD. So we're already sort of aligned just by virtue of the fact that our companies have operations there. Um, TNFD, if we're looking at that, they are aligned with ISSB. They have the same wording. Um, they work with CSRD. Um, they're aligned with GRI. So that is aligned. Um, I think that's... I don't think I have anything else beyond uh, that or on the standards. The alphabet you haven't used. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> sorry. I will, I will follow up with, um, with, with the breakdown of the actual words. But I think, so, so if you look at the investment potential mm -hmm. um, for investors to put money into projects off the back of TNFD reporting, for example, um, at the moment it seems to me we don't actually have a common approach internationally, <coughs> yeah, a common approach internationally to judge the investability of a project. Right. So I'm, I'm really sort of thinking about, that, that's what I mean by the metrics. Um, and, and it seems one of the opportunities we have in London, the City of London is one of the world's big financial centres, the world's most highly regarded financial centres. Could we and should we in the UK say, right, this is what we're going to do. These are the standards we're going to set, the metrics we're going to set. We're going to make sure we kind of tie into TNFT frameworks and so forth. But this is how London will judge the viability or otherwise of investments, the bona fide or otherwise nature of investments, try and create a common approach, which at the moment doesn't exist. So I think this is the UK green taxonomy, uh, which I believe is possibly up for consultation at the moment or is shortly up for consultation. Mm. Um, so we have, on the, so yes, we absolutely need the UK green taxonomy. There's a lot of discussion around the interoperability of the UK green taxonomy. What is pleasing to me, and I'd be biased because we are leading the advisory group on it, um, is that... <laughs> The, the taxonomy in the UK has gone a step further by looking at sustainable agriculture and fisheries and aquaculture, which has not happened in the EU taxonomy. So we can actually be a leader globally to say, if we do the other 50 countries who have their own taxonomies, this is how you might follow us mm -hmm. in um, actually looking at nature and not just climate. And Andy, do you think that's a sensible way forward? I, mean, I kind of think there's some of the big city institutions, even the Stock Exchange, could actually say, right, this is how we're going to make how are we going to create nature markets that are credible and have a kind of gold standard attached to them? I just want to slightly distinguish between a couple of topics which are linked and they're all closely linked topics but from our perspective and I think the perspective of a large part of the investment industry where you're investing in other companies, publicly listed companies and indeed at times privately listed companies, understanding nature risk, nature impacts, nature exposures is an important part of, certainly for us, the way we assess those companies and the way that we identify risk and the way we, we, we look for opportunity. That's where things like TNFD, better disclosure standards, become particularly critical because at the moment you're doing it on an incomplete and often inconsistent basis of information. So we do it, but it could be done a lot better. And, and that in turn can inform both which companies we are more likely to invest in as well as where we apply engagement and where we, we would look to engage with companies. You've then a similarly linked but slightly different, I think. How do you create a common basis of measuring the, the, the outputs, the outcomes that different types of nature-based investments would deliver. So in a, in a carbon context, here you've got a ton of carbon. You, you pay a price for a ton of carbon. So you can look at different types of projects and say, well, this, the price of, this, of a ton of carbon captured here is this much and a ton of carbon captured over there is that much. And you make assessments and different people will make different judgments about which one they consider to be higher quality and what they're willing to pay in different asset classes. And you very clearly have discrete prices in different types of, um, uh, uh, from different sorts of projects. And I think there is a big, the, the benefit of carbon is it's reasonably straightforward. The challenge of nature is it's, if you say it really quickly, nature positive sounds a bit like zero carbon, but it's, it's, it's a more tricky topic to get consistency around. I think the, a, a degree of establishing common frameworks and consistency around how we might measure that, it won't be perfect, crude as it might be, I think would be valuable. And it may be a case of, it, of not thinking necessarily about nature as a 
general mass or a general topic, but actually breaking that down into different, what I would think of as ecosystem services. So things that nature does for us, like capturing carbon, um, like limiting flood risk, like providing recreational services and thinking about the services that it provides, which are manifold and putting values to those things or definitions to those things in order that, um, that they can be more explicitly separated. So given the fact that at the moment nobody really has uh, found a single way to do this, is this not an opportunity for the UK? I would agree. Yeah. Yeah, I, well, I agree there's definitely an opportunity for the UK for, for many of the reasons I, I said to before I do, I struggle a little bit around nature because Mr. Mayhew sort of referred to the, um, you know, as far as how do you how do you measure it? There's not even really a consensus around measuring a ton of carbon. So when you start to talk about biodiversity credits, I personally struggle to consume that. And, and, and ecosystem services, I, I know that we 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 looked at doing something in in the U.S. called natural asset companies, and from memory, there's like 37 different ecosystem services. So to be able to standardise that seems quite a challenge. I, I think that if carbon is a good proxy for nature, and that's a question uh, rather than a statement, then I do think there's a real opportunity for the U.K. to be the global centre for raising finance in in, in carbon assets. Uh, which is perhaps not being grabbed at the moment. I'm just going to bring that to you. Just, just very quickly, just picking you up on that, Gordon. So what are the barriers which would prevent the UK from taking a lead in this market? Uh, specifically, there's a, there's, a, there's a few friction points that, that, that currently we're, we're working with uh, at an advocacy level. Uh, one is the legal treatment of uh, a carbon credit. There's a law commission consultation that's just come out, which I think is, is focusing on this on digital assets, but it seems to have a, a look through for, for carbon credits. And so defining a carbon credit as, as intangible property is, is key. Uh, the other thing is there's some tax friction in the, the VAT treatment of, of carbon credits that, that, that needs to be solved for. Again, we're advocating for this. And then the last thing would be the, the sort of the regulation of it. Again, it's an exam question. What goes wrong if you regulate it like a carbon allowance? A carbon allowance is a financial instrument. Uh, those are some of the most liquid markets in the world that hasn't stopped people accessing them. So I think that's the exam question for carbon credits from a financial regulation point of view. Can you treat them the same as allowances? Uh, and then you're transacting in somewhere that has a high bar of entry in terms of, in terms of quality market infrastructure. So those, those are three specific points. Just finally, briefly, if I may, um, you, you've been referring to the, uh, the, the complexity and the uh, difficulty of standardising uh, metrics across uh, the, the different elements of ecosystems. Are there any rules of thumb at the moment to how uh, landowners, um, uh, investors, brokers uh, share the, the benefits when they're entering into these transactions? Should I start off? I'm, I'm, I'm I mean, just, just please do interrupt if I'm not answering your question correctly. But um, So in the UK, for example, there is a common understanding that we're looking for soil health improvement, biodiversity uplift, net carbon reduction, water quality improvement, and then um, uh, natural flood management, so actually holding, holding the water. I'm not sure what the scientific term is for it. This is agreed by everyone. You look at the corporate sector, they understand these are the five priority things that they need to do. You talk to farmers, they know how to measure it. We have the tools to measure it. What we haven't got, however, is we haven't had it um, explicitly said by government that's what we want us to focus on as a country. And that is holding some people back because companies feel they can't go to farmers and say, this is what I want from you. And farmers feel like I'm not going to waste my money in baseline for this if, if I'm not being told by government this is what you need. So um, I don't know if that did answer your question, but um, OK. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much. That brings panel one to a close. Thank you very much to Andy Howard, Global Head of Sustainable Investment at Schroeder's, Gordon Bennett, Managing Director of Utility Markets and Intercontinental Exchange, and also to Helen Avery, Director of Nature Programmes at GFI Hive Green Finance Institute. Order, order. Well, thank you. Suspended. The proceeding is currently suspended. The proceeding is currently suspended.
The proceeding is currently suspended. The proceeding is currently suspended. The proceeding is currently suspended. The proceeding is currently suspended. The proceeding is currently suspended. The proceeding is currently suspended. The proceeding is currently suspended. The proceeding is currently suspended. The proceeding is currently suspended. Natural Audit Committee for our second panel uh, of our second oral evidence session into natural capital. I'm very pleased to welcome uh, Jonathan Sh uh, Shopley from the Climate Impact Partners. Uh, um, Anna Hall, can you pronounce that for me? How are you? How are you? Harry, sorry, from Respira, Chief Executive, and Oliver Lewis, who is the founder of Joe's Blooms. Uh, welcome. So uh, this session is, is, is keen to draw out some of the sort of innovations that are going on within the sector, uh, and in particular where the UK uh, has the opportunity to, uh, to, to lead in the development of these markets. So I'd just like to ask a, a general question to start with, if I may. Um, about the following on from what we were discussing in the previous panel is the extent to which uh, natural capital might be used as, a, as an opportunity for corporates to give them a, a license to pollute. Is, is that, is that a, a fair way of considering this or is that an unfair way? Jonathan, perhaps you might like to answer. Yes, I think um, uh, you know, I bring experience that we've had in uh, the carbon markets and particularly in the voluntary carbon market and it's often said that um, the process of offsetting uh, lets corporates off the hook and that's not been our experience and it's certainly not been what the research has offered up. Um, generally uh, markets for environmental in instruments give corporates an opportunity to compensate or contribute to repair uh, of impacts that they can't avoid. I would stop there. So, Anna, your company invests in, uh, uh, globally, I think. Um, to what extent are your corporate clients um, investing in natural capital out of guilt or out of necessity? Um. So just to, just, to, just to follow on on Jonathan's comment, I mean, I think it's completely the opposite. I think um, this um, whole issue around greenwashing, um, particularly within the, you know, where, where um, corporates are using carbon credits, I mean, obviously, I know that the definition of greenwashing goes much further than that, but in the context of using carbon credits, it isn't a license to pollute, it is, you know, the contrary. Um, when you look at all the companies, at least that we work with, um, they have very serious decarbonisation pathways in place and they're using carbon credits to compensate for the um, unavoidable emissions along that pathway. The research shows that companies who, um, have, um, who are using carbon credits as part of their decarbonisation pathways are actually decarbonising at twice the rate that companies who aren't. So I think, I think the research is now actually showing completely the opposite. I would also like to put it in context because 83, I think it's 83 or 84% of companies don't even have a net zero target or pathway in place. So aren't we blowing this all out of proportion? And rather than just focusing on companies who are using carbon credits who are actually doing something, we should be focusing on the 87% that is doing nothing. I think that's a very fair challenge. Could, could you characterise for us some of the nature of your investors and, and how it, uh, the sorts of transactions that they're doing, just to put it into context for us? Yes, so um, the projects that we work with and that we, we support are primarily in the Global South, 
um, the nature-based projects, combination of um, forest conservation projects and also removals projects, so mangrove restoration, um, reforestation, etc. So that is sort of primarily who we work with. And we work with um, developers by entering into long-term offtake agreements with them. So we guarantee to buy current and future um, issuances of carbon credits that are being generated by those projects. Um, we then are also working with, with corporates who, as I said, are looking to use carbon credits as part of their decarbonisation pathways. They have credible um, net zero strategies in place. And these corporates are um, typically you know, quite large corporations um, in the um, utility sector, energy and gas, consumer goods, so you know, across, across the spectrum, aviation, and so on. And uh, at the at present, are they subject to TNFD uh, voluntary disclosures, most of your clients, or, or not, are they not operating within a, f a financial disclosure and regulatory regime where that's required? Um, so um, the corporates that we're working with are making um, disclosures either on TCFD, um, TNFD we're seeing increasingly in the UK, um, C, common disclosure project, CDP, it's such a potpourri of um, acronyms there. But, um, but, but I would say that, you know, with those corporates who, again, are using carbon credits, they are also um, making the relevant disclosures. And just to build on what the previous panel was saying, you know, we, we really sort of strongly believe that disclosure and transparency is, is key and required. Thank you. Um, Oliver, you're operating at the mandatory level. Could you just characterise for us um, uh, the role that your company is playing? Certainly, Chair. Um, so, Joe's Blooms is a new company which was founded three years ago. Its objective is to support small developers in complying with the new BNG requirements. Uh, so, to that end, providing a range of tools, material, and uh, other means of support to encourage uh, small developers to not only fully comply with the BNG process, but also to embark on best practice at every single stage. And, uh, and how, is it, how far have you got along that journey? Because BNG is just emerging at the moment. Correct. So uh, BNG became mandatory for large sites on earlier this month. It will become mandatory for smaller sites on the 2nd of April. Uh, the government has, over the course of the last three years, iterated the biodiversity net gain metric. The final version was released at the end of last year. So now there's a clear uh, basis for people to measure biodiversity and biodiversity gain. That is now a clear and robust system and subject to no further major alterations. It's something that I think the sector can have confidence in and can be used as a bedrock to build upon. Can you say that with confidence at this stage, or is it, is it too early to assess whether it's um, sufficient and complete? So there has been a robust process over the last three years of multiple versions of the biodiversity metric being released. It's worth stating that the government has made clear its intention is for the metric to be reviewed at periodic moments and to be updated. I think one thing that is been very positive about the process over the last few years is you have seen ongoing consultation and engagement with both the sector and also with interested groups on how to improve the metric and that ranges from not just improving the ecological outcomes and the means of assessment but also in terms of accessibility making sure that all elements of the construction sector can meaningfully engage with it. And does it uh, link in to the voluntary uh, natural capital sector? Do you see that the, the standards being developed for biodiversity net gain can read across into the voluntary market? Will it provide a baseline of standards and metrics? Definitely. I mean, I want to just say that, uh, for my part, we are focused exclusively on BNG and the mandatory BNG uh, from that perspective. So uh, I would just want to caveat uh, my following marks with, with that. However, I would just say that what you have with BNG is not just a standardised metric, but also a robust and fairly comprehensive set of approaches as well, which have been set out in government guidance. And the hope would be that, you know, with the caveat again, that obviously this is refined and improved over time and we learn from best practice, it would be my hope that actually you do have a standardised approach to best practice, which is adopted uh, in other parts of the sector, because we can all benefit from learning lessons uh, from different approaches. And do the others, Jonathan, do you, do you see biodiversity net gain mandatory requirements as providing sort of helpful underpinning to the development of this asset class, if I can call it that, in the UK? Well, again, you know, like I'm just picking up some of the conversation we had before, I think the missing piece in 
both carbon markets and biodiversity markets is demand. So it's not, uh, you know, it, it's essential. Um, and I think that, you know, what we've done well here in the UK is we've created opportunities for supply with the Woodland Carbon Code, the Peatland Code, Salt Marsh Code that's coming up. And these are creating instruments of real quality and an opportunity to direct finance to these areas. But we haven't tied it tightly enough to a compliance need. And, I, and I'm going to leave it to you to talk about the ETS, perhaps. But, you know, um, I would say that the voluntary carbon market, uh, which, you know, has been touched on quite a bit, uh, is a market that evolved in a vacuum that was left by the failure of the Kyoto Clean Development Mechanism to really take root. And we've kind of, that market has carried the can waiting for governments around the world and governments domestically to really create clear demand signals. And I don't know whether you feel that there's a strong enough demand signal in, in, um, um, you know, in, in the sector that you're serving. If I come in, I mean, I think uh, there are very promising signs there in the sense of BNG is now a mandatory requirement or will be from 2nd of April. So that does create uh, you know, a strong demand. I think that will be a powerful incentive for people to want to move into uh, the nascent market. Uh, I will just point out that it's important to make sure that uh, all the different players in this uh, new field have the support that they need. Local planning authorities, uh, primarily among that, will be key players in making sure that obligations are discharged correctly at the validation stage and also in helping to uh, make sure that off-sites can enter the market in a prompt way to ensure that actually there is not the inverse problem, which is not enough supply to meet the demand as a statutory regime kicks in. Are there any other countries in the world that have set up anything like this? I think, um, I mean, the one that I'm um, aware of is the United States has about a $10 billion biodiversity offset market, but it's very, it's not traded, it's not very visible. There are banks of projects that are set up, and if you're creating a new factory or development, you are given a, uh, a financial tag and told to fund a project, a pre-approved project, to that um, level of investment. And those so, are state by state. They have their own rules and regulations. You've got state by state, and there is, a, there is a sort of federal framework, I believe, that that works within. Not, is that mandatory, or is that...? That's mandatory in the sense that planning permission or permissions to develop are a conditional on making that, that investment. And I think here in the UK we are sort of heading down that path, looking at planning as the main mechanism. I think that's what part of us in that game requires, or will do from the 2nd of April. Right, so you will, you, know, you must secure BNG and reach a standard which the local planning authority is satisfied that you've complied the statutory obligations before your development may commence. Thank you. Chris Craving. Oh, sorry, Caroline had a very quick in Thank you. follow-up. Yep. Very, very quick, sorry. Uh, on monitoring and enforcement, a question for Anna, because I know that in September 22, Respira and DRAC signed a memorandum of understanding to secure up to 2 million tonnes of CO2 removal certificates in what Drax called the world's biggest carbon removals deal. How will you, given that as an example, guarantee the sustainability of those removals at Drax? And in particular, that question, I think, is more timely now that we've had the NAO saying that um, the UK cannot guarantee the sustainability of biomass. So how can you, as a private company, guarantee that when we've got the government saying that they cannot um, yes, so the MOU that we entered into with Drax is for um, BECs in the BEX credits in the US um, from um, plants that they're going to build out there. And um, the point of this is that you know we're working with them whilst they're developing um, the relevant sort of methodologies and verification methodologies, which weren't in place at the time. This is obviously you know an emerging an emerging area, and only when we're comfortable that the methodology and the rigor sort of stands up to to scrutiny would we then follow through with with that contract. I mean, I would say that. You know, I think drags do actually um, take sustainability um, seriously, um, and at the moment, you know, we're very comfortable working with them. So you've done your due diligence. You think there's no problem? We've done, you know, we've done our due diligence. We've, um, you know, we've been out to the U.S. to visit to visit the plants. We are sort of quite comfortable with the process as it is as it is evolving um, at the moment. Yes. Thank you, Chris Green. I should add just on back, Caroline, that. I share many of our anxieties you heard earlier. I'm not convinced at all now about the biomass argument, just so you're aware that that issue is, is, is growing. Um, 
that we're dealing with different dimensions of what happens here, ranging from a small wetland created by a small developer as part of their requirement to provide biodiversity net gain, through the other extreme to theoretically a huge reforestation project underpinned by a mining company trying to offset its impact on nature. So uh, having a coherent and credible set of metrics uh, for investors and indeed markets to use to judge the quality or otherwise of a, a project is extremely important. What is the role technology can play in doing that and did what experience do you have of any of you using technology to start to really track the effectiveness of, um, uh, of projects linked to the nature capital markets, voluntary or BNG or whatever? If I, if I jump in there, um, I think that technology absolutely has a pivotal role to play yep. in helping to facilitate uh, engagement with and compliance with uh, these new obligations. Uh, from our part, you know, we, we look at how one can effectively engage with the metric and make sure that it's being filled in correctly and also highlighting best practice in the approach to BNG. Um, I think that there's also a role for technology as well in other elements such as monitoring, enforcement and making sure uh, that there are, uh, you know, there is effective implementation of the policy. Uh, one thing I probably would flag is that it's important to know both where technology can bring benefits, but also where possibly it can go too far. And I think it's vital to remember that in a discharge of, uh, you know, certainly from BOG's perspective, the discharge of duties does require somebody to be there to be implementing, uh, you know, the, the policy correctly to make sure that the data going into the metric is accurate. Uh, to that end, the government has created a very sensible system, in my view, of having for small developers a competent person requirement and then for larger an ecologist uh, requirement. And to my mind, that is a very <coughs> a, a sensible uh, and yeah, balanced approach. What is the technology that is going to end up at the core of this, in, in your view? I mean, there are examples of technologies out there that use soil samples to assess the scale and mix of biodiversity in, area, in an area before and after. Um, what, in your judgment, will the, 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 the most likely area of technology to be at the heart of this uh, be? So I believe the, Im the importance of uh, the metric, as has been set, set out here, is transparency and consistency. Uh, so making sure that the data that is being entered is robust, that actually you know, is coherent, is, I think, a vital first step, because if you don't get that correct, actually you have systemic issues going forward. Um, I think there are interesting other parts of uh, you know, the system and the approach which technology can benefit. So you refer to you know, mapping and uh, you know, solar, etc. I think that is uh, you know, interesting. I know that the Scottish Government is looking at some parts of this in terms of how they want to implement and adopt a, you know, a biodiversity gain approach. Um, my point would be I think that probably has to come after you create a system which the whole sector can engage with and is robust and sustainable. So I think... Where does the data come from? So what, what, when you talk about the data, what data are you talking about? So, uh, under, so underpinning the BNG system, you need a competent person or an ecologist, uh, depending on the site size and nature, to actually have entered in the data on the site, what the baseline is uh, for that site. So making sure that they can you know, assess that uh, what's on the site and enter that into the metric and engaging in the metric to find the best net gain possible that's where I think technology can immediately provide a so real That's benefit. why I was pressing, because then it comes down to the judgment of an individual. Um, uh, do you envisage that being replaced by an upfront technological assessment on a site? Uh, I don't think so, no, because one of the things that uh, the policy has you know, consistently said, and I think correctly, and other uh, bodies like SAIEM have highlighted, is the importance of realising that each case is case-specific. Mm -hmm. So having the assessment of someone who is competent to do so, to look and uh, gauge the vi but both the accuracy of the data being entered but also the viability of proposed solutions is, at least for the you know, foreseeable future, I think essential. So how do we regulate the organisations that are delivering that service? Uh, I think that regulation of such services is very important and I think that's one thing that uh, you know, I would encourage the committee to look at, have, making sure that the sector can have confidence in uh, you know, people, technology, etc., who are helping to undertake this assessment can only be a good thing from my perspective. And again, goes back to the points that I think we don't have that yet. That's the next step. Okay. I think that would be a very useful thing to see develop. Okay. And in terms of the quality of the kind of core assumptions, so at the moment, for example, 
Um, there are measurements for um, uh, salt marsh, ordinary agricultural land and so forth. How confident are we that we've actually got a quality set of baselines for all that work to be done? Uh, so, in t uh, so in terms of the, the metric, as I said uh, before, I think that yeah, the government has gone through a really <coughs> genuinely robust approach. It's worth saying that BNG has obviously been in development since, I think, 2008, and the fact is that you had a cross-party engagement and uh, input into this system as it's been developed. Um, and one byproduct of that has been successive iterations of the metric getting external feed in as well. You do have a range of broad habitat types now uh, embedded into the metric with different degrees of distinctiveness uh, within that. Uh, you know, from, my, from my understanding, you know, that process of ongoing engagement has created something which is you know, robust. I think you know, government is, can have confidence that what it's putting out uh, will stand up to scrutiny. That said, of course, it has rightly also said that in a few years' time it would look to build upon this and return. So ongoing iteration while giving the sector and wider society confidence that you know, what they have is robust and will stay for the medium term, I think is essential. Another thing you were going to say? Yeah, no, I'm really pleased you raised that question because I think you know, what's going on in all of these markets is we're becoming much more concerned about the quality of the instruments and that the quality of the instruments depends on an accurate baseline and then ongoing monitoring. So particularly with nature-based solutions, uh, nature-based projects, um, satellite imagery, big data management and AI have become hugely powerful um, and are delivering, I think, efficiencies that are going to help um, counterbalance the increased costs of commitments to transparency and commitments to ongoing monitoring. Uh, rather, so, for example, in a typical forestry project, you'd set a baseline and you'd take measurements. Uh, at the moment, they could be done by hand. Uh, increasingly, they can be done through satellites and then augmented by uh, site visits. And then that information is stored in blockchains, uh, which then means that they can be shared with registries around the world. So, for example, the World Bank, Singapore government, and the International Emissions Trading Association has set up the Climate Data Action Trust, which is a uh, consolidation of information around not just the baselines but the projects and whether they've been validated and then how they're being verified. For projects it's a critical step forward because uh, nature-based solutions, those that deliver climate and biodiversity benefits, take a long time. You know, if it's an afforestation project uh, you might have to wait seven to ten years before you get a verification exercise out. In the old days, if it was done by hand, that was an expensive uh, situation. Now you can always do it year by year, which allows the project to monetize their climate and biodiversity impacts uh, more frequently and therefore uh, you know, uh, reinvest that in the operations. I think the transparency piece is huge. Um, we in our business have now got a, uh, um, a portal which allows our clients to literally say what their emissions are, scopes one, two, and three, which instruments they've purchased, which ones they've retired, what their uh, SBTI, uh, science-based targets or other targets might be. So that brings enormous transparency. And I would say that some of the corporates that have really moved from philanthropy, their first engagement on voluntary action into, like Microsoft would be an example, or Salesforce, uh, they see uh, this market uh, as a real opportunity for their core services. So they've gone from philanthropy to CSR to sustainability to license to operate to now thinking they have a role to play in exactly that piece, bringing technology to bear. Okay. Last question for me, just going back to the specifics. What, do, have any of the three of you got experience in looking at DNA-based soil testing as a mechanism for tracking progress or otherwise? Uh, and if so, what's your assessment of it? We've got the nature DNA in our sites. Um, we personally, given that you're asking all of us, have not done a lot in the agricultural world, which is really where that plays a part. We've done things like um, uh, camera traps in our forest to see what sort of biodiversity uh, benefits are, and, uh, are, are accruing to those areas, but not with the DNA. We've kept an eye on it, and I think those sort of things and some of the <coughs> outside of biodiversity or direct biodiversity, clean cook stoves, the fact that you've got sensors that figure out when those stoves are being used and how much, just sort of amazing. The DNA piece, I think, is extraordinarily powerful. 
Mm. And it really will help the agricultural sector, which we haven't played in that, that great degree. No, I mean, we've done, we've done um, soil carbon um, project in the UK, but not using, um, not using DNA, but doing soil sampling and then um, incorporating that into you know, MRV and um, satellite monitoring and building the system that way. Um, so not that specifically, but just to reinforce what, um, what has been said here is that the advances in technology, particularly geospatial technology and AR, are really sort of bringing us leaps and bounds on with the sort of measuring of, 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 of carbon. Uh, so we don't have direct experience of uh, these technologies uh, in terms of BNG. Uh, you know, such technology is not required at this stage. However, I want to you know, align myself with what has just been said, which is this technology is obviously coming on leaps and bounds, and it'll be very interesting to see how it can be incorporated. Thank you, Chris. So just picking up on that, are any of you aware of existing satellite capacity? You mentioned the Singapore government scheme. Uh, is that available yet in the UK for companies interested in monitoring uh, the... So just to clarify, what I mentioned in Singapore is actually a registry of registries. So that brings transparency around the like uh, transfer of ownership of credits, for example. In terms of what's available um, for satellite imagery, there are a number of private companies around that are doing this work. Uh, and then there are organizations like NASA who are making some of their satellite imagery available free at the point of access. And then a lot of the tech companies are coming in and doing the big data management, taking all those readings and then trying to figure out whether an area under a project is actually improving and then providing um, updated information about uh, those key metrics. And I'm sure we probably all read about this satellite that's able to spot methane uh, emissions and, and has captured some uh, um, you know, very, very large emissions in that space, uh, in, in that area. Thank you. Actually, if I can just add, I mean, some of the leading private companies who are doing a lot of this geospatial work um, and developing it are based here in the UK. Thank you. What do you want? Thank you, Chair. Um, I just want to move on to the concept of greenwashing or indeed the deceptive uh, practices employed by companies and indeed traders to create an illusion of environmental responsibility while while in fact disregarding the true impact of their actions with misleading and false claims or indeed uh, superficial sustainability uh, projects or initiatives. So I wonder if I can just turn first to you, Jonathan, and ask how can an investor or trader be assured that the credits or natural as assets that are being conveyed are actually truly linked to positive environmental outcomes on the ground. Yeah. So, um, you know, in the carbon markets, and I think we've also touched on in the biodiversity markets, there are a range of standards and standard bodies. And I think in the biodiversity market, um, it's a little younger, so there are lots of uh, approaches to baselining and then measuring improvements. In the carbon market, um, those standards generally are sometimes called interchangeably standards or registries. So basically, they have a number of methodologies that have been peer reviewed and published and tested. Um, once a methodology is approved, say for an afforestation or a forest protection kind uh, type of project, uh, the project developer then has to validate that they have the wherewithal to meet the requirements of that methodology, and then over time they get verified by independent auditors. And once that happens, you, the, the credit, uh, the instrument is created under that methodology and put into the registry. And at that point, the project developer can transfer ownership from themselves to a buyer or somebody who's going to retire it. So the short answer is that we depend very heavily on the credibility and the quality of those standards that are creating these instruments. And the standards that are common, commonly recognized in the carbon market are the gold standard, which is sort of European, VERA, uh, which is US, American Carbon Registry, and a number, and a number of others, actually. And at the moment, um, remembering that these are standards that have grown up in the vacuum that's been left, as, as it were, from uh, you know, delays in the Kyoto Protocol and the Paris Protocol. So lots of these standards have developed uh, variable, varied approaches 
to how they baseline, how they measure additionality, whether this finance is making a critical difference. And that has been critiqued. So the greenwashing that you mentioned, in my view, falls into sort of two camps. One is the quality of the instruments. So we really are people purchasing and retiring instruments that have genuine environmental impacts. And then the other piece of that is the integrity in which you use those. Do you use and retire credits and make a claim of neutrality, which hides the fact that year after year, your underlying emissions are, being, are increasing? So I would say that in the market today, um, the issue is being addressed by two multi-stakeholder initiatives. The one is on, on the quality side, the ICVCM, which came out of uh, Carney's um, task force for scaling the voluntary carbon market. And they are developing core carbon principles, which all of the standards are being asked to step up to, to create minimum acceptable quality standards for the instruments. And then the other side of the greenwashing equation is, are companies using these instruments in a credible, high-integrity way? And there's another multi-stakeholder initiative called the VCMI, the Voluntary Carbon Markets Integrity Initiative, which is paying attention to that, making sure that the claims that a company might make <coughs> on uh, having a commitment to net zero, making progress to net zero, being carbon neutral, that those claims have integrity and are I think the word they've used is unimpeachable. You know, that if a company says they're on the path to net zero, there is a standard and a set of evidence to prove that that's indeed the fact. I don't know whether you, <laughs> others will add to that. Very comprehensive. That, that, I mean, that's quite comprehensive. What happens if a claim is found to be inaccurate? What, what then uh, happens to the original uh, trade or agreement? So uh, just again, if I can, just separate that into the quality of the instrument. So it's quite possible that a project will, uh, could fail uh, to deliver uh, credits or, as has happened in the past years, that somebody, you know, somebody's gone back to that project and found that uh, the verification of the instruments hasn't been adequately done, uh, you know, comprehensively done. So the standards themselves provide some guarantee, particularly on nature-based solutions. So if a project underdelivers their buffers to make up, for example, if an afforestation project suffers a fire, so all that carbon gets lost from that project um, at some date after a, uh, a sequestration credit had been issued, then the, the standard itself can make up that difference, make sure that the environmental integrity of that intervention is secured. Um, the other instances um, that I can think of on the claim side, I mean, there really it is what we are seeing now. Actually, you're asking what happens if you make an, a, 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 um, an inappropriate claim. I think there are organisations like here in the UK, the Advertising Standards Authority, that has got itself involved in claims that they believe to be misleading and have forced organizations to retract those claims. So that would be an example I'd give. Yeah, and then it also depends. I mean, we know that, you know, in, in the EU, we've had the Empowering Consumers Directive. We've got the Green Claims Directive coming through just to, um, you know, essentially address those issues of making of making false, false claims um, through the use of, of carbon credits. And um, there's also been an increase in litigation against companies who've been making these, these, these false claims, so to speak. I mean, I just do want to come back to the point I made at the beginning, that whilst we do have to have you know, integrity of claims and how these carbon credits are being used, I think this sort of kind of phenomenon now of greenwashing and the fear of being appearing in The Guardian or in any other publication has actually had an increase, uh, actually a very significant impact on demand. And you know, all of us panelists are sort of saying that the real issue that we're facing in the market is demand and lack of demand. So, um, I, and this, this we really do need to address and corporates now need actual you know, air cover to use carbon credits because they're now completely stepping away from this, and then this has, you know, an impact on nature. It has an impact on biodiversity. It has an impact on climate. It has an impact on on communities. The demand and corporates having air cover and legitimacy for actually purchasing these carbon credits is, I think, what we should really be turning our attention to a lot more now. Okay. I mean, how 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 sustainable is the methodology that you're referring to in terms of how often and how regular? 
can they can that be repeatedly assessed? So there are a couple of things that happen. First of all, um, you know, in nature-based uh, situations, the the baseline needs to be reassessed every now and again because, um, you know, for example, on forest protection, uh, the Red Plus projects, as they're called, they generally are trying to address illegal logging or you know, uh, um, in a particular area. Um, and as government policy gets applied, um, the rate of illegal logging or fires in an area could decrease. So the baselines have to be reassessed at a certain interval. And I don't know what they are, but they're normally somewhere between five, seven, ten years, I think. And, and similarly, even outside of non-nature-based uh, um, non uh, projects, the baselines have to be reassessed. So that's to make sure that there's no, what do they call, hot air uh, within these projects. In other words, as we make improvements in the way in which we manage our natural assets, that those are reflected uh, in the baselines. The second part of that is the methodologies themselves might need to be updated for a variety of reasons. Um, so in soil carbon, which none of us have uh, overly, uh, um, you know, that's a real challenging area. But what we're finding is that we're getting, through technology, opportunities to upgrade the methodologies and the way in which we measure, the frequency with which we measure, the sample sizes that we can get without putting people on the ground, for example. So the methodologies go through uh, regular cycles of improvement or, in fact, if there's no additionality argument, as we've found with renewable energy, as that has become you know, cost, a cost-efficient alternative to fossils, that that methodology uh, for creating a carbon credit is actually retired. So I mean, you're referring to when and if uh, errors occur in the system, and I'm really referring to uh, deliberate uh, misrepresentation. So if, if for example, 100, tree, 100 trees are required to be planted in the first year, when are they next counted, and is progress reported back to the investor? Um, I'll just finish that off. That's okay. So, um, you know, the verification exercises that come along, you know, that are, that have to happen before a credit is registered in the registry, means that they will see whether trees have burnt down, been chopped down, or you know that they are actually in place, that the sequestration has occurred. And if there is a gap in that, then the buffers generally that are held by the standards will make up that difference. So I think, I think that was the question you were asking, but Anna, maybe you'd um, take, pick yes, up on Yes, I can that. just pick up from that yeah. too. Um, so yes, every time you're issuing um, a new batch of carbon credits, so usually issued in vintages, annual, annual um, you have to go through the whole verification process all over again. So you have to have it you know, verified, audited, and as we were discussing earlier, now with the um, increased use of um, geospatial um, data technology, you can actually measure on a continuous basis the fact that you know that carbon is being sequestered as it's increasing the biomass of trees and so on so so actually to that extent um technology has really has really improved but the other development which i think might have been also what you might have been asking is what happens if there's you know um fraud you have deliberately gone and said that um you know this tree was there and 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 it didn't and it, and it isn't there um um, this is where the UK has also innovated by developing um, insurance products to, you know, to, to address these issues. So um, a year and a half ago, um, there was a fraud and negligence um, product insure that was... Um, Sorry. How do you insure against illegality? You can't. You can take out an insurance. You can take out an insurance premium for fraud or negligence. But just to finish that argument, I, basically it will replace the credit that you thought you had, mm -hmm. but don't because of fraud. Um, and so they will, the insurance policies are very different, I think, and they're just sort of emerging, but they will make you whole. So if somebody steals something from your home and your insurance covers you, they either give you the money or the replacement. And that's the type of insurance that's been brought to market. Mm. So, so, I, so if, I, if I, I don't know if, Anna, if you'd finished your point, but had you finished your point, Anna? Yes. I mean, so if, if greenwashing mm. is suspected, um, where, if anywhere, can this be reported for independent investigation? 
exactly yes, but I haven't. Um, I don't know where it can be reported for an independent um, investigation, but there are certain, you know, for example, um, there are increasing cases of um, litigation being brought against companies for, for greenwashing. So, for one, you know, they're facing in increasing um, legal risk. Um, to the extent that um, you know, reporting becomes mandatory if you're mis if you're if you're misreporting. So I'm I'm not quite sure how it works um, in the EU now that you know um, you have to report your emissions on an annual basis if you're misreporting them. Um, I don't know what the consequences of that are, but I'm sure that there are consequences. But but certainly you know litigation and companies being sued is very real. So may I add yes, to sure. that? Um, you know. I think that, um, for example, in the United States, in the California scheme, if a organization that is generating carbon credits turns out to be out of compliance on a health, safety, or any other um, uh, uh, regulatory uh, uh, requirement, all the credits from that project get suspended or canceled. So within a compliance system, um, there are very direct controls. In the voluntary carbon market, um, I think I'd agree with you, there's no central body, there's no compliance entity that looks after that, but uh, Gordon's comments earlier about the transparency in the market, you know, we have these registries, we know how many credits are there, you can go and see uh, who's retired what, and if uh, you care to, or investigative journalists care to, you can go to the project and see whether that project is doing what it says it's doing. So that sort of transparency opens up the possibility for any um, affected stakeholder to sort of investigate whether things are as they are said to be. I can see that Oliver wants to come in, but let me just also ask a plain question, which is, do you believe there should be an independent regulator uh, I think in the UK? Uh, so or anywhere? I, I'll just limit my remarks, that's okay, to BNG, which is the nascent mm. area which uh, I'm focused on. Uh, in terms of BNG, what you have is you have <coughs> you've got the new register that's being set up to be run by Natural England to record the uh, units, but also worth saying that the Environment Act envisions uh, these, uh, you, these sites being uh, you know, connected to local authorities via conservation covenant, and that means that local authority can monitor and enforce the obligations that are set out within that and can indeed take enforcement action. Now that leads to a question of do local authorities have the resource that they need and the support they need to discharge those functions, but I think that is a sensible basis. It's also worth saying that one of the uh, byproducts we have of how BNG has come around is you have an extremely transparent medium in the form of the metric sheet itself, which is an Excel sheet. All of the data is set out there in terms of what the baseline is, the intended habitats, and indeed the calculations that have been used to reach those. Um, and I think it's actually a good product that you have such a transparent medium being used, and I would actually encourage that it's maintained as the basis because you have a single uh, metric sheet, highly accessible, allows you to hold individual sites to account and make sure that they genuinely reflect gains, but also allows, uh, going back to my earlier point, uh, ecologists and others to engage with the mathematics behind it and suggest improvements over time. And where is that held? Thank you, Claudia. Is that held by the local authority, that metric sheet? Yes. So, uh, when you submit your planning application, you'd have to provide the Excel sheet, but also you must provide it to the register as well if you're engaging in off-site units. Thank you. Jerome Mayer. Hey, thank you very much. I think you were all sitting... You all heard the first panel, didn't you? Or, yeah, good. Yes. Um, I, I just got a quick set of questions to come give you an opportunity to build on what was what was the evidence that we heard in the first panel. And this is about opportunities for UK natural capital. I again would really appreciate if all your answers were focused not on carbon but on natural capital, because there's a temptation to get into that area. And really, we're focused on natural capital here. Um, so we, we heard from the contributors, didn't we, that. Uh, the, currently, the size of the market is de minimis. Um, I think he said it was 0.2% of, of investments were in, in this sector. Uh, we've heard that this, the scale of the investment opportunities is tiny. So a couple of million quid here, a couple of million quid there. Yeah, a, big, a big scale sale of I don't know, forestry products would be 100 million. I mean, that would be a very large um, forestry transaction. And in the scale, that is too small for the vast majority of significant investors for them to, to get involved in if you're, if you're responsible for investing billions of pounds. So over to you, what's the solution? What should we be doing to create the investment market that is, that is investable 
from the from the investors, the, the retail investors perspective. I'm going to start, and anyone's putting their hand up, otherwise I'm going to pick at random. I'm going to start this end. Look, I think, um, you know, one of the things we, well, my company started off as Future Forest in 97, 2001, and um, we had 90 afforestation projects running uh, in the UK under what we were called then as Future Forests. And you're right, I mean, it was a real challenge to get, I mean, some of them were run by district councils, some of them private landowners and so on, and we still have a, uh, a duty of uh, monitoring over, over, those, over those projects. So scale is an issue, but you know, the other thing about biodiversity is it's very local, and I think I also heard, I, I don't know whether it was Schroeder's or, 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 or I say, um, you know, it, it, it happens project by project. Uh, you can cut it any way you like, but somebody's going to have to get boots on the ground and do some planting and do some management. So unless you've got vast tracts of land and you're prepared to do this on a sort of an agribusiness scale, it's going to be really challenging. So I have a slight... Solution. Pardon? That's the problem. That's a problem. Um, I think... I'm not sure there's an immediate solution. Under the carbon regime, we had what we call programs of activities. So you could set a set baseline and just repeat the projects. You could roll it out geographically. Problem with biodiversity is it's so contextual. It's really quite difficult to do that. Um, South Africa has a biodiversity offset market, which is really quite intriguing. And they allow quite a fungible market, but they weight up. So if you lose an acre of feinbos in the Cape, you have to create something out of you know, the Karoo Desert, or the, you know, a vast area. So they've got some mechanism to balance that out. Um, I think that um, the transaction costs are quite high when you do lots and lots of small projects. And I think, uh, to Chris's comment earlier you know, about technology, I think that helps solve a lot of that, 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 uh, um, uh, that uh, particular yeah. issue. You, you, you mentioned the satellite which can assess methane emissions. But you know, a top-down look can tell you a certain amount. But when it comes to biodiversity net gain and the maintenance of it, yeah, I think without someone, yep, putting things. Although you know, running a small project, if you have to put verifiers into the field every year to go and check that out, and you know, so some of these maintenance of the exactly. So if you can reduce the transaction costs, which are such a high proportion of the operating costs for these projects, that's one way at it. Yeah. Uh, maybe I'll stop there, because I'm not sure it's solvable, but I'm interested to hear what others think. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, we've, we've, we've struggled to um, raise capital for, um, for, UK, for UK projects. Um, you know, initially, because we, so part of what we do is we want to channel, we want to channel um, private capital and institutional capital into nature-based projects. Um, Global South, and I know you want me to focus on the UK, and, you know, and, and UK as well. And, you know, in, in one respect, it should be um, relatively easier to, to raise institutional capital for UK projects. But it comes back to that problem of the scale, the cost, the transaction costs, the incentives. You know, if we, we've sort of looked at, um, um, you know, peatland and PIUs and invested in one, pro you know, have got one project instead of PIUs. But again, you know, struggling, struggling to, to scale that, struggling to get the landowners um, on board with agriculture and soil carbon you've then got to um, another aspect of you know biodiversity you've then got to get you know the farmers on side and there's you know cost to them do they want to set aside the land what are the incentives that can be that can be created there? The, uh, there is a document which is eagerly anticipated called the land use framework um, but which has not yet been published but the, the, the mood music from government is that they don't want large blocks being, let's say, rewilded. They want to have a patchwork approach so that it's the, the inefficient field in a farm which is set aside rather than great blocks of productive farmland, for example. And I you know, put my hand up, I represent a East Anglian constituency and I'm a director of a farming company as well, so just to interest. Um, and that, by, by almost by definition, if that's the object, then every single scheme will be small in its scale, the vast majority of them. They need to be small, relatively small scale. Can I do, and now, you know, now that we've discussed it, but I, it, one of our early project partners was the forest of Marston Vale mm -hmm. uh, up in the Bedford area, and that did have scale. 
uh, and that was hugely helpful. But in fact, what stopped us there was demand, actually. And land is hugely expensive. Uh, that, that was the other issue. But to your point, you know, just making it very local for a moment, I live about 10 miles away from Nepi State that's been fam you know, famous for its uh, um, restoration, uh, rewilding. And what's interesting for me is that they've... Farming is as famous for. <laughs> um, what is uh, interesting is that it, it is not a replicable model, if that's what you're saying. But what it has done is they've now got the wheel to wave, and it's a group of farmers who've sort of said, I can see the value in putting some of my land aside. And so there is now a voluntary commitment among those farmers, as I understand it, to do something to create a corridor for wildlife right down to the coast. That's another so, I'm going to come on to you a second. We, we seem to have identified both a problem with demand and a problem with supply. And yet, um, we seem to be expressing you know, surprise that this market isn't flourishing. Where, where do we go from here? Oliver, do you have a solution? Yeah, I, I think actually the solution in many ways is linked now to delivery. So now that BN, mandatory BNG yeah. is here, it should, keep, with demand, should. it should absolutely help with demand. The key point would be effective discharge of duties that have come under the Environment Act. So we need to now make sure that you do have you know, local planning authorities able to. You know, ensure at the validation stage that developers are complying with their obligations, making sure that you know, people who come in to supply biodiversity units can do so and you know, the effective conservation covenants are, are set up. Um, from my perspective, the point that's raised is completely right. What you want to see as a byproduct of this uh, policy different types of biodiversity gain site emerge which will do different things, complying with Lawton principles. Certain areas, large sites, would be appropriate. Other areas, you know, farmers putting aside pits of land would make a, a lot of sense. But the key thing here across the piece is effective discharge, because not only does that, you know, obviously make the wheels turn, as it were, in terms of uh, things happening, but it also gives confidence to investors, because if you want to, if you're thinking about moving in and investing capital into creating biodiversity sites in the first instance, you want to know that you are investing in something, into a regime which will stay consistent which has a clear set of rules, exactly, it's a fair market based on the statute. So that's where I think the attention needs to go now, which is effective discharge across the piece uh, and making sure that, you say, L LPAs have the uh, resource and support they need to perform their functions. But it's not just on biodiversity where that has benefits, because if you deliver this effectively and you start to see, investors start to see that, yes, this mandatory market is something we can have confidence in, it's something that we feel we can invest in as a sensible uh, strategy, that means that if, as and when the government, as it hopefully will, move into other forms of net gain, so for example, you have marine net gain now, which is nascent, uh, it also means that there'll be confidence in investing in those areas too. So you, as you develop confidence, you gain confidence. Exactly. And just finally, you've mentioned South Africa as having a, a scheme. Are the, should we be learning from international comparators? Where do we sit in the scale of things? Um, Are other countries doing it better, and should we be learning from them? Yes, I think so. And, and I think another thing that the UK could do, as you were saying, you know, what is the solution? Um, I think part of the solution is to integrate voluntary carbon credits into compliance markets. Leave carbon credits for one side. Just natural capital is what we're... Well, natural capital, but I... I and I'm sorry, because my, my main expertise is, 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 in, is, in, is, in, is in, in carbon and, um, you know... Um, carbon does actually encapsulate um, natural capital and biodiversity. Anyway. Well, it encourages you, <coughs> yes, but certainly with, you know, a lot of forest conservation projects, cut stove projects, um, you know, those, those credits are incorporating SDGs, biodiversity, community benefits. So effectively, they have actually been bundled in the, in the carbon because otherwise, you know, we can enter into this debate, you know, is a ton, a, a, you know, a ton of CO2 should be a ton of CO2, but it, and it is, but it's all the other, you know, it's all the other aspects that get bundled into that ton of CO2. So when I'm talking about carbon, um, and the reason why we're focusing internationally is because of all of the other impacts that it creates, and that's a really important component. So, so I apologise if I, you know, keep referring to. It. But so, but, but going back to the question, going back, well, yes, I wanted to, you know, how do we create, how do we create demand, how do we, you know, solve for the supply demand um, issue is not to have it be. Voluntary. I think we need to make it mandatory. Um, you know, you've got the mandatory biodiversity net gain, and I just, you know, why why are we only because what we're trying to address here is is essentially you know climate change in one way or another through nature, I believe. So I think Singapore is a country that's really leading by example, um, and I definitely. Uh, 
urgency standards is what is it that the court's doing that we're not. Um, so, <laughs> so, um, so, so Singapore um, are allowing for the use of um, international voluntary carbon credits into their compliance system. Um, they've levied a carbon tax, um, and you can you can um, you can give uh, sorry, you can sort of essentially pay in voluntary carbon credits for up to five percent of your carbon tax. They're driving up the price of you know carbon every year. So it's starting at 25 Singapore dollars next year. Then um, in 27, 28, it's going to go up to 45. So essentially, they're putting a real price on nature and a real price on carbon, and allowing you know um, and allowing um, um, carbon credits, international carbon credits, to go into that. Because you've got a cap and trade system or an ETS system that essentially you know um, tries to disencourage negative behaviours. Whereas um, nature-based projects are actually incentivizing positive action in reductions and removals. Can I um, add a final to comment and then back to the chair? Um, what I think Singapore has done in the carbon market, it's beginning to do in the biodiversity market, which is to create a centre of excellence internationally. Uh, what you've seen them do is set up this Climate Action Data Trust. Uh, they are getting uh, carbon exchanges set up in, you know, giving uh, incentives for all of the players in a more mature ecosystem, carbon trading ecosystem, sort of come to Singapore. And what I noticed on the last trip I did there, which was um, beginning of last year, is that the universities are now developing competence around biodiversity metrics, uh, for example, in measurement, and so they're getting some of those private satellite companies to come and be present. So they sort of, they don't have a solution, and I'm not pointing to them as a hub, but they've got a hub. And I know you've got a UK um, focus here, and I think what the UK has is enormous bits of what could be a hub. Obviously, there's the City of London and the secondary market. Um, but, you know, we've got uh, NOC, the National Oceanographic Centre uh, down in Southampton, I think, which is doing an amazing amount of work on uh, baselining for marine systems. Uh, we've got the Woodland Carbon Code, which actually has some tremendously um, innovative mechanisms to support markets by giving a guaranteed price to the market, a reverse auction system which says if you can't sell it on the voluntary market, we'll be the buyer of last resort, which gives confidence and removes risk. And then the, the old Woodland uh, Carbon Code, which sort of set up the market here, is also another example uh, of where the UK has got bits, and I'll, and I'll echo Anna's uh, position as well and sort of reference California. Um, we have an opportunity to use the ETS, the Emission Trading Scheme, to capture credits from projects that deliver verified biodiversity co-benefits, and it would be a shame not to use that. And I think California uh, has done that. You know, they're regulating the energy, you know, the, the high-emitting sectors, and say agriculture is tough and difficult to deal with, methane is difficult to deal with, so we'll use the offset mechanisms to address those within the ETS. And I think there's a real opportunity here to do the same. Thank you very much. And I apologise, I have to leave early. But. Thank you, Jerome. Barragon. Thank you, Chair. Um, first of all, insurance against fines imposed by a regulator or official body for criminal or quasi-criminal conduct is not permitted under English law for public policy reasons. So my question, first of all, to you is when you made that statement, who is doing the insurance? Who is actually insuring? Private underwriters. No, no, sorry, uh, so let me rephrase it. Um, who is taking out the insurance? We've taken out the insurance. As? As the provider of the scheme? No, no, we, we take out, we've taken out insurance um, for fraud and negligence um, on the issuance of any carbon credits that are coming off, that arise from the projects that we're backing and financing. Um, I, don't, I don't want to get sucked down a rabbit hole here, um, but it seems to me that in so far as you are an aggregator of schemes, mm. I can put it that way, this is like the industry ensuring, uh, the, the sector ensuring it, its, its businesses um, 
against an illegal action? Um, against a negligent or fraudulent action. On their part? On the part of the, of, the, of, the, of the project developer or any of its service providers. Yeah. Um, I, I suspect we, one would need to evaluate just what, what distance there is between uh, any organization such as Respira that was putting those, those different projects out to, to the market um, and just quite how that would work in English law. Because it, it, it might be, just to, to try and cut through this, it might be helpful if Anna could describe the kind of transaction where this applies. And it, I, I think you're investing in, you mentioned mangrove earlier, you know, if you're investing in a mangrove swamp, which is not available in the UK, so it's external, if you're, the you're investor, checking the due diligence. Well, in, if you're the investor, then you're like the, the homeowner insuring against a burglar. Yes. That's, okay. But you're, you're, you're not on the, as it were, you're not an aggregator for the, the project operators. That's no. what I had understood you to be. No. Describe what you do. So... Um, so we, um, we enter into long-term purchase agreements with um, developer, developers of nature-based um, projects. So, for example, um, one of the projects that we, are, we, we buy carbon credits from is a, the largest mangrove restoration project in the um, Indus Delta in Pakistan. We commit to um, buying current and forward issuances of carbon credits that, that, that are going to be generated by that project. Um, and then we, we, we buy them, we own them, and then we work with corporates who might then buy those carbon credits off of us. And what we are insuring, or we're taking out insurance um, against... That you is, are not defrauded. That we're not defrauded, exactly. By, yeah, due diligence by, risk. My, 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 Can I just ask on that point? So, so when you're buying carbon credits from the Indus in, uh, in India, how are you measuring... And who is doing the measuring of the credits? Yeah. So, um, so that is so that is done by the um, that's sort of part of the verification and auditing and monitoring um, process. So initially by the project developer, but also using lidar satellite technology, and then that whole process has to be essentially verified by a third party, external third party, independent third party. Well, no, sorry. What I wanted to talk about was the difference between voluntary and compliance markets and how we might uh, um, learn from uh, the existing uh, markets in a way that could be applied to natural capital markets. Um, now, you, you spoke of uh, America. I, I was in Washington during the parliamentary recess talking about sustainable agriculture, it's very clear to me that um, what we, certainly in the UK and Europe, regard as you know, regulation um, is regarded there as you know, unwarranted interference by the federal government. So the idea that this is going to be uh, easy to do on a voluntary basis in a context where we don't have the same, what I would call, European understanding of the role of statutory frameworks and, and statutory regulation. Um, I just wonder what are the things, because you said earlier, look, we need to make this compulsory. We need the government to make it compulsory. But the idea that that's going to happen in certain areas of the world um, particularly in the US, um, with their sensibilities and sensitivities to uh, government regulation, I would have thought is extremely difficult to see. So how, where, where do we take the learnings from the carbon markets and then push them through into the biodiversity, the natural capital markets? Can I have a crack? So... You know, I think we're already seeing the voluntary carbon market being regulated um, in many ways in terms of its transparency, 
in terms of the requirements on the standards to create instruments that can be traded in commoditized markets like ICE. Um, so it's, it's whether you mandate a scheme like I understand we have in America or parts of America where you know you are required through the planning process to make up or compensate. I think that um, what we're looking for from government is a clear framework in which to make decisions. I mean, I can tell you a, a quick story of a conversation I had with Dieter Helm when he was head of the Natural Capital uh, Commission. And uh, we were rebranding. We'd from still be building gas-fired power stations, according to Dieter. Well, here's what, he, here's what his challenge to me was. I went to see him because we were rebranding as the natural, uh, natural Capital Partners at the time, before our merger. And I said, you know, um, and he, he said to me, either you're really very brave or very stupid, because without a framework set, to your point earlier that I heard in the first panel, to set the social contract on biodiversity, who the hell are we to decide what is a good project or not. So I think there's a, a critical piece to be done there, and whether the 25-year plan does it, or any of that does it adequately in the UK, is questionable. Um, once you've done that, then looking at the way in which the Biden administration in the US used um, uh, the IRA, um, IRA Act, the Inflation Reduction Act, yeah. to say we are going to invest in an infrastructure to decarbonize this economy and in the private sector you just go at it. We're not going to tell you how to do it, but we're going to give you the wherewithal. Here in the UK, when it comes to renewable energy, I know this is far away from biodiversity, we don't have that infrastructure. So, so you believe that we should continue in, in certainly in the Labour Party with the £28 billion I didn't hear, uh, so you, you believe that we would be well to continue with the £28, pound, 28 billion pound pledge that we had in the Labour Party until recently? Or are you unaware of that? I don't know whether I'm qualified to comment on that. I think that I, we I'm need... just drawing you into... <laughs> uh, I, but I think what I'm suggesting is that we need a very clear framework. And if you want to take something from the carbon markets, the NDCs, the Nationally Determined Contributions, we need national biodiversity programs and then we need a little bit of infrastructure. We had that in the MB Sats and it hasn't worked. It was one of the things that in what 2013 um, the the biodiversity COP we eventually took that that movement yeah. towards going in the same way that Paris had for the UNFCCC and and the CBD COP eventually got there with MB Sats and they weren't worth the paper that they were written on and they don't provide a, a, a standard framework cross-country, cross-border, to be able to be of, of use in the same way as, as the UNFCCC. Well, actually, what you're describing is the current state of NDCs across the world. So, you know, give it a bit of time. We've been working at uh, the UNFCCC for uh, three decades, and we've barely got a grip on it. I think biodiversity is coming up really fast, um, and I think there are a lot of lessons to be learned from the carbon markets, and I think you're highlighting what those are. I wouldn't be too pessimistic, though. I think from the last um, you know, gathering that progress has been made on those national and interna uh, international linkages. Let, let me push. What, what is the impact of the price drops in natural capital credits, such as the carbon credit market? I, I mean, we've seen prices plummeting. Um, so, um, is anybody I, else? Sorry, yeah, yeah, I, I, I don't want to stop home. you because, but if, if anybody else wants to come in, but please go ahead. Um, you know, there, there was a very successful application of uh, market based approaches on uh, sulfur dioxide, and basically what, what happened is the allowances were restricted and the price of an emission of sulfur dioxide went up, and that was a very successful application of carbon markets, the externalities, internalizing the externalities. What we've had in the carbon markets is we should have had that. We should have actually seen a very steep curve as we sucked out all the cheapest ways of removing, using markets to find the next cheapest way of removing an emission. We've talked about quality and we've talked about integrity, but we haven't spoken about ambition. And ambition has been missing. 
across the world to really tighten it up. And if we had have done that, if we could have done that through the NDCs or whatever mechanism, that's what we should have seen, a repeat of the sulfur dioxide markets, a rising price in carbon. But as a result of that and as a result of you know, a variety of other interventions, the view that carbon credits are a new form of investment, cryptocurrencies, etc. We've got a highly volatile market, and it really hasn't served our purposes. I do. I'm sorry. No, and that's, but, that, but that is partly what Singapore is trying to achieve through the through the through the you know tax rate yeah. that's going up, and South Africa yeah. is South Africa is doing the same thing. Um, and the monitoring and reporting duties under the biodiversity net gain uh, framework be read across into voluntary assessment standards, do you think? I mean, uh, I'll just uh, come on that. So talk about the, on the BNG regime, one of the obvious issues that we have is that it's fundamentally nascent and we have to see what the proof of the pudding is uh, in terms of that. I think what is good that we have seen uh, from BNG is an awareness of some of these limitations that you have seen on, in you know, the, the other markets that you, we've referred to. Um, I think a key point will be whether or not the enforcement powers, which are envisioned to be created under conservation covenants, uh, come into force. And a key trend to monitor is do you see the adoption of conservation covenants, which are obviously set out in the Environment Act, being adopted and, and used, and then how that is discharged. There's also points of nuance as well, of course. So, for example, if a habitat bank is destroyed by an act of God, or just the simple variations that exist within, which mean that you know, perfectly legitimate aspirations to create uh, certain gains over a certain amount of time don't amount how that can be you know, successfully ameliorated and, and dealt with. So I think that there's, uh, in the same way, I, I take the view that we should be learning lessons you know, across the piece uh, and that each uh, sector should learn from the other. Uh, with BNG, a key point is how do these, how does it actually work in practice and how do we, you know, hopefully there will be lessons to learn. To Ms. Harry, um, you spoke earlier about um, using carbon markets and, and using carbon as the way of, as it were, getting into biodiversity credits. <coughs> and you also spoke of the, the way in which there isn't a single price for carbon, and to a certain extent that reflects the fact that some have other beneficial public, public goods thrown in. So <coughs> with... Um, deforest, avoided deforestation or whatever. Um, what do you think the danger is of carbon coming to dominate the way in which we talk about oh, well it already does I think but how, how do we stop it becoming the only metric that we use when we're talking more widely about biodiversity credits? <coughs> I mean, sorry, can you leverage the difference that there is when talking about the price of carbon f for those different additional benefits? Can you say, oh, well, we're, we're, we're giving a carbon price there because it's got these additional benefits, therefore we already have evaluated the additional benefits. Now let's look how we've done that and, and create it as a separate element in the market. You, you, you see where I'm going? Yeah, how do, we, how do we stack it rather than bundle it? Yeah. Yes, yes. <laughs> Basically. Um, and, I think, and I think we will, you know, and I think we will, we will end up going down that route. I think the reason why we are getting this, you know, sort of mix up of, of carbon with biodiversity and other benefits is because um, we actually have carbon credits now and they exist now and we have scale in them now, whereas, you know, biodiversity um, credits are relatively nascent and, and the scale isn't there. And, I, and, and I, I believe that the reason is to say why we're using carbon as a proxy is because we need to take action on climate now. Um, and yes, we've got to look to the future. So I think we really need to see this as an and, 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 rather than a zero-sum game, which quite often it's, it's, you know, it's portrayed as it's this at the expense of that. And it can't be this, at the, it can't be nature at the expense of technology. It can't be reductions at the expense of removals. It can't be you know, carbon at the expense of, of biodiversity. We need all of it. Um, and, and, and we need to sort of act now, and we need to act in the future, and I think we just sort of need to see it as part of, as part of a whole. Um, you know, I know that when I'm talking to um, 
UK corporates, for example, they're much more focused on, on, on TNFBD and on biodiversity credits because, in a sense, they're like brand new and they're not tarnished with you know any of the complications that have come from you know um, uncover and, and we absolutely as I say have to keep developing that but we're sort of kind of doing it at the expense of you know something that we have now we're throwing away the baby with the bathwater and I just think we have to change our way of sort of seeing it and seeing it as a win-win and an and-and. Uh, just to come in uh, on that point I think I completely agree it's also worth saying that one of the uh, key principles that is set out in the uh, the guidance documents to accompany BNG is the rules on additionality, so you know, how you can use those, those, uh, you know, those sites. I think it's important that we keep track on those and make sure that it incentivizes the right behaviour as well. So uh, it's an interesting answer to the point that was raised in the previous session about, well, how long do these sites last for, and etc. Actually, you can see how possibly additionality and the uh, chance to return could actually create an answer to that solution. So, um, no, I completely, I completely agree with that point, and additionality will be something that has to be monitored very carefully. And uh, if I could just add to that, Oliver, you know, I think I'm glad you brought up the additionality piece because, um, you know, particularly in the carbon world and in the biodiversity world, if you're going to take credit for something, you need to make sure that it was your money that made that happen, your investment and your capital. And, uh, you know, one of the things that, I, you know, is happening around the world is that as our sense of urgency increases, we're layering on regulations, grants, subsidies, taxes, and it makes actually it, it may, it's becoming very difficult to prove the additionality argument. And that's one of the things we've got to watch out for. And certainly, EU, uh, you know, which took a long time to reform its ETS, still suffers a little bit of you know this overlapping uh, policy work. It makes it very difficult. And I suppose I feel somewhat a, a purist that if you allow an ETS with, a, with an offsetting mechanism, whether it's for biodiv with a biodiversity purpose or climate or both, uh, that to let that instrument or that approach do the heavy lifting seems to me to be the right way. Um, and you rely less on grants and subsidies and things that distort that market. Thank you very much. I think that concludes our panel. It's been very informative. I'd like to thank Jonathan Shopley, uh, Anna Horry, and uh, Oliver Lewis for joining us today and for your terrific contributions. Order, order. Thank you very much. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended.